Welcome, one and all, to Superhero Stuff. You should know this is Ben Juan Grimm. And with me is... Fantastic Drew, everybody. Yes. We're Happy New in... Year. Happy New Year. Yes, we're bringing in 2024 with Marvel's first family, the Fantastic Four. Woo. And uh, a lot of our show has focused on lost media with unproduced scripts and unmade movies. But this is one of the rare instances where a movie was made, but not officially released. And that's the Roger Corman-produced Fantastic Four movie in 1994. 30 years ago, with its anniversary coming up this year, and for the anniversary and discussing the making of, the, of that first live-action Fantastic Four movie, and many say the best Fantastic Four movie, <laughs> uh, we have the editor, Glenn Garland. Hello, how are you? We're great, and great. Uh, with us is uh, the director himself, Oli Sasson. Hey, everybody. Good to be here. <laughs> Very good having to you be both. here. Yeah, I, I met both of these uh, gentlemen at LA Comic Con a day before the panel I was on, and it was a screening of the documentary Doomed, which I know a lot of people have seen. Maybe some of the the audience hasn't yet. Definitely check that out. But it covers the behind the scenes story of what happened. There'll be some overlap in terms of what we ask and uh, what's in the documentary. But uh, you all had such great stories, and I wanted to ask a bunch of questions to all of you up there. Uh, so I'm happy that we're here now with Andrew a month later. Yeah, a month later, finally. <laughs> so, indeed. Let's see. For first question is uh, sort of, let's start with the beginning. You know, tell us how you came to be a part of the Fantastic Four. Well, I guess uh, since I was on the the job before Glenn, I'll start. Uh, I had already made a couple movies for Roger, and uh, there was uh, no hint at all that he was going to be doing this movie, uh, I was uh, driving down San Vicente Boulevard, I believe, uh, near the Beverly Center, and my phone rang, and Roger was there, and he said, Oli, it's Roger, and I said, hey, Roger, how are you? And he said, uh, how would you like to direct the movie about the Fantastic Four? And I said, the comic book Fantastic Four, and he said, yeah. <laughs> And I said, yes, would love to do that, Roger. I was a big fan as a kid, and uh, that's essentially how it started. It was just that quick and that simple. Um, and you then said, so you have $30 million to do this, correct, Roger? <laughs> <laughs> well, that was, my, that was my first mistake. <laughs> you have all the money that we need, right, Roger? <laughs> I, I was, uh, once again, you know, I mean, you know, the enthusiasm back then for, to make a movie to begin with, e even now, I mean, I still get enthusiastic about making a movie, but, you know, back then it was, uh, you know, you're, you're younger, obviously, and you get an opportunity to be in Hollywood and you get a phone call and, and it's not just any movie, it's a movie about, you know, those guys, you know, the Fantastic Four. I have and, to ask, uh, this was 1993 when you get a call, so this was on a car phone? Or was it? Yes, you... yes. It okay. was a, a, an old gray Motorola <clears throat> flip phone. Okay, you know, got it. Motorola. Yeah. Only yeah. had one of the first ones, actually. I oh, remember okay. uh, we'd go to lunch and we'd all be like in awe of this, <laughs> this giant phone that was about the size of the computer. Like, it was well, huge. Well, it was the, the first one we had to put the, the a box this big. Uh, I mean, it was huge. I mean, that big in the trunk of the car. It was massive. Right. You could hold. And you could hold away. down a bunch of. You could hold down all these scripts with it. It was. It was amazing. We were. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> Big paperweight after a while. Yeah. Cheers. But anyway, that that's 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 just how it started, and and um, you know, of course, you know, finding out as soon as I got to to the office, you know, he said, "Okay, it's great. We're going to do casting now. We're going to do this. We're going to do that." And I said, "Well, what's the deal?" He said, "Well, we have to make the movie before the end of the year." <laughs> and I think this was um, maybe November, you know. What yeah. I think it, I think it was <laughs> October, November, and and yep. I said, oh, <laughs> you know, and once again, you know, I'd already made a couple movies for Roger, so I was kind of used to the drill, and I just said, okay, man, let's just let's just do it, just dove in, you know, and that was that's how it all started, really. Wow. And the reason why it was supposed to be done by the end of the year, only you could probably tell them that. It needed to be started by a certain point and ended by a certain point in order for the rights to remain with uh, New Constantine. 
Okay. Yeah, that was uh, that was that was uh, what we learned uh, much much later. Obviously, when uh, and I, I thought maybe we could save that bomb when we get there, but uh, okay. that's, that's... <laughs> we'll get there. <laughs> <laughs> but that's what. <laughs> Oh yeah, well, well, that's what happened. So interview's over. Okay, see you guys. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, well, I mean, the audience knows that uh, some yeah. there's some reason oh. why this was not released if they haven't already seen the uh, the documentary. So, right. uh, but we'll get into that a little later. And uh, Glenn, how did you come to be part of this? Well, uh, I had we worked on another film before that together Oli? i think I we did might you, have did you do the any of the other roger corman movies that i did were you editing? i had done a bunch of there, roger right? corman you movies like... but i didn't i didn't do the don the dragon movie that what was, was the, the movie you did one, right before don the dragon I did, um uh well that was the first one with uh the the late great richard roundtree um who just passed away a few months ago mm. um the movie actually turned out really well. It was, uh, it, 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 it actually was. A, it got a good review in, uh, in Variety, believe it or not. I still have a I copy of it in a file okay. somewhere. Yeah. I think what happened was uh, I was available and I had been a fan of Oli's work at Roger Corman's. Uh, and I believe that... Uh, he was looking for an editor. And uh, I think maybe Catherine Siren said, Oli, you should take a look at Glenn. And I was really excited about the possibility of working with Oli and to work on the Fantastic Four. I was, I was like, wow, this is going to be amazing. So I was excited. And I met with Oli and, you know, he, uh, he didn't throw his phone at me and it was great. <laughs> Always a good start. <laughs> that would have killed a man back then. <laughs> I, oh yeah, that too. <laughs> no, I, I, <clears throat> to, to whether or not he was happy. I think he was happy at the time. I think I talked him into it. <laughs> I was I was very enthousi- enthusiastic about getting people on board to come help me make this movie. So because <laughs> I, yeah, I kind of knew I was I was, I was happy difficult. to do it. Uh, yeah, I would have uh, I would have uh, said yes fun. no matter what. But uh, yeah. Fun. It was oh. great. It was, it was a, it was a journey though. Uh, it was not like, <laughs> it was like not it. like the other Roger Corman films. When no. we would do post on those, we were cutting on film in those days, and we would edit on a movieola, and we'd cut a whole movie from the beginning of of the shoot to lock in six weeks. So it was we would be flying. And this, this was a little bit different process because we had all the visual effects. So, back in those days when you edited, could you like start editing as soon as you got dailies, or what, the movie had to be completely finished and then you started no, editing? No, we would uh, we'd get dailies. They uh, okay, they'd go yeah. to the lab that night, and yeah, then uh, the next day they they'd have dailies. So, so it was a little okay. bit slower than it is now with the Avid, but it it was. It was pretty fast. Maybe it was two days instead of one or day and a half. But yeah, we I was cutting while Oli was shooting. So he could okay. come check out stuff as it was going, as we were putting it together. So you would have basically assembly cut pretty quick. Yeah, we, we over at Rogers, we would try to have an assembly done within three to four days after they finished wow. shooting. Did you use any ch- temp tracks while editing before score was added? I mean, we did, but I'm trying to, th- yeah, we, we would have some temp tracks, but it was, it was fairly rudimentary at that point. It's, it okay. wasn't easy. Uh, we would have separate reels where you'd have some music and a few sound effects, but mm-hmm. uh, it wasn't like it is now with uh, all the tools that you have at your disposal. <laughs> Yeah. Mm. Like if you were yeah. going to do a dissolve, it wouldn't be, you wouldn't see the dissolve. You'd see this grease pencil mark that would go across from one shot to another and you go, oh, okay, that's yeah. your dissolve. Right, right, right. <laughs> Amazing, isn't and, it? <laughs> and you just have to imagine it. You just have to imagine it. You'd have to like think in your head, this is what it's going to sound like. 
you know, but right. there was a, it's, it wasn't I know, point. But it's crazy to think that that is exactly the way they were doing it since the silent era. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. I mean, the movieolas, they, they looked almost as identical. That, you know, right. I don't know if anybody out there knows what a moviola looks like, but it, you know, it's a, it's like a, a box on a stand with a little screen about what was the screen like about four inches by four inches or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And and that was it. And you had two, you know, the reels that would, you know, you'd load up the sound on on a, on a reel and you'd run a picture on another one and you'd run it through this machine and you'd have to step on the pedal like on a sewing machine. And you right. know, to, and you and you have to start kind of slow, and you know, and it had a, a an electric motor in it that if you the more you step on the pedal, the the more electricity went through the the motor, and the faster it went up to speed at twenty four frames a second. Uh, is, is that is that about right, Glenn? I mean, that was that's, that was a movie over. That's that right. was it. So you could go you could go a little slow, and you could go twenty four, but you couldn't you couldn't go faster than twenty four, and. Okay. I mean, I think I think there was like when you went reverse, you could go forty-eight frames a second. But, oh, uh, weird. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I had, had a little. A, go ahead. Had a little handle on the side of the screen, so when you're watching the picture, you can stop it. You can. Yeah, like we would call it a break. Oh, yeah. The break and, was hand right there. So he said, "Oh, I can't mark it on." So he then he flipped the screen back, and that's the the little the, the the literally the frame of film is right there, and in the uh, i don't know what you'd call it in the gate and he, you'd yep. have that grease that gate. grease pencil and just go bip bip put an x on it there if you wanted to cut there or whatever it's unbelievable man unbelievable that's incredible it's like i remember this, yeah. the cigarette burn stuff in fight club oh, yeah. they talked about a little bit um, yeah that's probably somewhat related anyway but uh I added on a Steenbeck once. That's probably similar to a Moviola. Moviola. Yeah. Oli, Oli and I uh, did a, a film on a flatbed. A uh, mm-hmm. couple of them. But uh, I still like the Moviola better than the uh, flatbed. I, I feel okay. like there was something about that handbrake that you could really <laughs> push it. And you could get it down. Whereas with the... I always <laughs> felt like when you you used a Steenbeck and you hit stop... It would sort of roll to a stop a little bit, and it wouldn't be as exact. Okay. And you got more frustrations out with that handbrake. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you 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 have the director go and now and you. <laughs> I, can, I I find it amazing that you're able to edit so quickly using Oof. that because I mean with with Avid and stuff I could see, but with the that that. Le, you know the technology at that time it's it's kind of amazing to me well when you're working about 100 hours a week for roger Corman, <laughs> which was pretty close you just get good at it <laughs> you just get you know you get fast and oh my god and you can get a lot done in uh you know <clears throat> i guess hours. it was more like cutting cutting amazing. a movie in 12 weeks because you'd be working 100 hour weeks so were you sleeping? Were you guys sleeping there, like at this movie? No. The, okay, no, so you no, were you were going no. home. Okay, no, I heard we'd of that. Go home. Okay, no, got place, it. Place was too dirty to sleep in. <laughs> oh yeah, well yeah, I forgot about that part. Okay, <laughs> okay, <laughs> got it. Yeah. Were you guys comic book fans going into this? It seems like you were. Well, I I was definitely a, a Marvel fan. I wasn't much of a DC fan. Uh, nothing against DC comics, obviously, but. Uh, you know, Marvel characters for me personally, I could relate to them um, because they were just ordinary people that had extraordinary things happen to them, and and thus they became su- superheroes. Uh, whereas DC comic, you know, heroes are all from another planet or something, you know. And right, uh, that's the thing that I really, as a kid, I mean, I, I'll have to admit spider-man was definitely my favorite marvel comic character um i like the idea of spider-man because he was more or less a loner you know and you know i i think i was you know growing up i was a little bit of a geek you know and i liked the comic books and you know i was a big beetle fan and i played guitar and then you know and and doing doing stuff like that you know i could i could you could you could go in your own world. You know, if I pick up a guitar, it's just me and the music, you know, and it was like, and I, and it was like that when I, you know, around that same time, there was a revival house movie theater in New Orleans. And I would, 
right take the bus down there and it would it was like the double feature you know on saturdays and i'd go in there and watch the double feature and they were showing 16 millimeter black and white movies from from you know like now you can go see it all, all on turner classic movies but back then i'd, I'd go to, and it didn't matter what it was i would just mm. i just wanted to go sit in a, in a theater you know on a saturday morning for for nearly three and a half hours or so and watch old movies and to this day and i remember like movies like that i saw with clark gable and you know and gene harlow i saw a film i remember like one of my favorite films back then at, at, at the at the double feature was china seas and and i just i, I love the magic of those it was on a boat you know and i love the magic and the the glistening moonlight that they would put in a black and white film that was behind them you know that was a that was a process shot and 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 mm. even even the night scenes i can I, I would i would look at these things and i would see the the light literally just glistening off of gene harlow's bottom lip and i would get excited you know <laughs> Just and and not and I, yeah, obviously there's a sexual excitement about seeing Gene Harlow when you're 15 years old. <laughs> However, it was the 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 whole magic of the light and the imagery and the music and the, I don't know, man. I was just I, I was just a a, a a movie buff, you know. I just and I, and I have to just to admit that the Beatles, A Hard Day's Night, was the film that I saw that really you know got me into the whole idea of becoming you know a filmmaker or a musician or something more or less in the arts i i didn't want to go to the, my brother went to medical school my sister went to went to law school and i you know and i went to the movie theater you know so it was, <laughs> <laughs> and anyway okay. that's that's kind of like uh i don't know how i got on that side track but uh no, that's okay Did I, any I, of those classic films movies. any of those classic films kind of play into Fantastic Four, uh, as far as like we want to cite well, this, we want to homage this, or the general vibe of when any one of those classic movies seep its way into Fantastic Four. Well, I'll tell you what, not not necessarily the old the, those. I, I'm sure somewhere in my subconscious, you know, there was some something that you always fall back on and relate to it, you know, and what you've learned from just being a cinephile. Um, but the one movie that I, I really referenced was in regards to the thing, it was The Elephant Man. Okay, and, got it. And we could talk about that scene where, where you know, I, I envisioned, you know, before we started shooting the film, you know, because the thing is, and he's he's damaged goods. He's he's an outcast. He's a freak. And that scene in The Elephant Man where they chase him down and they get him down into the pissoir under, under, underneath the ground there in, in Paris or wherever it was. And the, these people are chasing him and he's, he's trapped in this bathroom and he turns around against the wall and he says to these people just about ready to stomp him. He just stops them cold by saying, I am not an animal. And it's like, <laughs> right. boom, you know? And I thought, wow, that, to me was, I, I had vi visions of like the thing as strong as he was and as powerful as he was, you know, and he is, and he could, you know, when it comes to clobber time, he could, he could knock the crap out of anybody. But I wanted to see a scene where he was, because he was so upset about who he was as a, as a, as a thing mm -hmm. that he couldn't defend himself that he would have to, because he was so ashamed of who he had become. And I wanted him to, to be running from almost in a sense. And I, I like to say homage instead of stealing a scene, but <laughs> we never could get that because we didn't have the budget. And, you know, the, the, mm. the so we took the thing. I, I still got a scene that was similar to that in a very minute way is that small as the small, homage, if you will, when we took uh, Mark Sykes, who made the documentary film, who was also in casting of the Fantastic Four, mm. he put on the thing suit. He put the rubber suit on and we drove down to, to uh, the, we had a, I had a, I had a 
Airy 2C, 35 millimeter camera, and two rolls of film. <laughs> and yeah, there you go. And <laughs> and I we we had to go find a place in Hollywood where there was a lot of natural street light. You know, the street lights had to be there, otherwise, because we didn't we went out there with nothing, no lights, no crew, no anything. And we pulled up to a, a, a stoplight. We, we, we drove around. We said, okay, look, this corner's all lit up. And then we can run into this this overhang at the store that's closed, but the lights are on. So we got a little light in it. And then I had a light meter. I said, oh, yeah, look, we got enough to expose the, the, the film, you know. So <laughs> he stops at the red light. And, and I start rolling the camera. And I open the back door of the van. And he jumps out. And, and <laughs> with all the cars and the headlights at the intersection pointed at him, he makes no a run permit. across the <laughs> what? No permit. Oh God, no! <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Did no, you guys get any was, crazy and, looks from anybody? Like you know, like sure. what the fuck is going on? Or... <laughs> well, I, pro- I, I don't know. I guess I would imagine you know the people in their cars watching this this thing go, walking across the street in front of them was probably wondering what the hell was going on. And I, I recruited a, a, a w- couple <laughs> girls uh, at the time to, to be in the in that scene just so I could have a couple people, you know, reacting to him when he's begging them to just oh, right. look at him. Look, it's, this I, I, this is not really who I am. I, I just want to talk to you as a person. I'm, I'm and I had these two girls underneath the lights like scream and run away from him and panic and <laughs> and that was my. Uh, that when you go back and ask me about what what movies I could relate to, I, I knew there was I'm sure but something else would pop in my head, but that was the one. It was okay. the elephant man. Okay, got it. Yeah, and, and I remember when I was talking to Oli about the project before we started, he he really wanted it to be about these people who were a family, and then by a freak accident, they had been basically made into these freaks and how you had this, the heart of the whole film was the fact that you've got these freaks who need to try to come together for a greater purpose. And I just, I think that what was so great about what Oli was describing was it wasn't just comic book love it, it, it was comic book love but it was it was getting at the essence of these characters it was really trying to understand who they were and it could be any kind of movie because it dealt with all these human emotions and mm. i think that that's what's so special about it is that because we didn't have the money it was all about let's really get to the essence of what the fantastic four are about and let's go back to the origin of what Stan Lee was creating. Thank you. It felt, it felt very I, I was going to say, felt. sorry, I was just going to say, it's that was what Stan Lee had written. It's what he created. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the humanity in his comic book characters, it's already there. It's, mm-hmm. it's, it's in there. And you have to recognize it. And I think that's been an issue with the, the subsequent movies of the Fantastic Four is that they don't have the depth of what the characters and the intention of the characters that Stan Lee had created. They, you know, they just missed it, man. And, and people, whether they are aware (laughs) of it or not, I think it's subconsciously, you know, it's just a, it's just the feeling of being relating to the universality of being a human being. And, those characters were created that way. And just, but just to add on to what Glenn yeah, was saying it, about it's not, the it wasn't about the spectacle as much as yeah. it was about who these people were and what having these special powers did to them. And it wasn't always like a great thing. You know, Spider Man is very conflicted because, you know, it's very hard to, to be loved by other people when you have these special powers. Yeah, for sure. I mean, they, that's why I think a lot of people say this is the best one because it carries over the heart and the soul of the original comics and the um, or even the like. My introduction to Fantastic Four was an animated series that came out around the same time. I think as as when you were working on the movie or when the movie was to be released. And I remember 
feeling, the desire to see like a live action movie version of it. Little did I know as a young kid what was really going on, <laughs> what you two had to go through <laughs> uh, at that time. But um, I, and then that was kind of it in terms of my main experience. I had seen the 2005 movie and then I didn't see the sequel and I definitely didn't see the last one. Uh, and <laughs> then, you know, because partially due to LA Comic Con, I knew that there's this documentary. I really wanted to sort of find out what is, you know, what was this original one that people have, have talked about. And it, it did feel like it brought me back to seeing that cartoon, to recognizing these characters and now brought to life. And just I, I really would have loved this as a kid, as somebody who grew up with that cartoon to see basically those characters brought to life because with with basically what you did and what Craig Nevius did with the, the script definitely carried over the characters and brought them to life. Absolutely. And I, I remember only one of the things he was saying is we don't have the budget to do <laughs> all the things that the fantastic four can do, but what we can do is really get at the essence of who these characters are and what Stan Lee was trying to say with the Fantastic Four and this dysfunctional family. And I think that Ole just, and Craig, it was just a beautiful uh, collaboration that they just really made something very special because I think we made that movie for under a million dollars. And it uh, it's kind of incredible. Mm -hmm. But to, yeah, the, uh, so. to that whole point though, is that, to give a lot of credit to the cast, mm. yeah, to the actors, yeah. they were yeah. they. We had this conversation with them before we started shooting, and trying to, and they, but they got it. They they got the what you just said, Ben. They got the heart and soul of the characters. Mm -hmm. um, we talked about it briefly, you know, because everything was brief and prep. <laughs> um, but <laughs> to, to get to, to they they really did a great job. All the, mm -hmm. the actors, you know, yeah, did a wonderful, wonderful job in bringing these characters to life. I think. Yeah, 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 for sure. Yeah, they're incredible. Uh, I remember as well at LA Comic Con, uh, going back to sort of influences on the movie, but the major comic book movie that had come out right beforehand on the DC side was the 1989 Batman movie, which our audience is a, a huge fan of. And I remember you talked about visually. You were evoking that, and I can kind of see that too. With um, sort of when we look at sort of the stills, the use of the, the shadows, the way that they they look um, on the screen here. Let me pull this up. Uh, but uh, yeah, this if we look at Doom too, you know, it's not like this brightly lit. He's in the sun type of thing. Like there's an atmosphere to it that I really oh right. really yeah, cool. the mo mood lighting and stuff. Mm -hmm. This. I mean, all of it's great, especially for the budget you guys are working with. But the, I mean, the Doom costume was killer, man. Yes, it's like you you <laughs> ripped it from the page. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I this is I personally this is I want them to just do this, just do this for the yeah. <laughs> for the next big budget film. Mm -hmm. You know, the reboot that they're going to do at some point soon. You know, so yeah, I, I was I was really into the Doom costume. Yeah, we're both Doctor Doom fans, so yeah. we're both really happy with the treatment of Doctor Doom here, especially <laughs> yeah, compared to later yeah. versions. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it looked awesome. Glenn, yeah, well, you never that uh... did that. Yeah, oh, sorry, from uh, Optic Nerve, um, John ah. Bullich mm -hmm. and Everett Burrell. That, that, those two, those guys. I mean, once again, everybody. I don't know why or how, but man, everybody just got so involved passionately about this film um except the one guy that that uh, glenn mentioned earlier in visual effects um that is in the everybody else everybody else was so passionate about you know being part of this movie and the, these guys yeah you know i went to the golden apple on melrose the comic book store and bought bought out every uh, reissue they had of comic book number one mm -hmm. and tried to hand them out to some of the heads of the department and we all talked about it um, and saying look we don't have the money but look what we can do we can try to make this a little bit of retro 60s but look at the drawings and the way that Jack Kirby and th these guys were, were created to begin with and the way they built this doom and the, our thing 
Mm-hmm. And I've had kids come up to me and everybody come up to me and when you screen the first documentary said, your thing is so much better. It's just the way it was yeah. supposed to be. <laughs> we didn't, we didn't try to stealth it up and do anything. And the, the head, the two, I'd say, you got to have, you know, if nothing else, we got to get two emotions out of this head mm-hmm. for the thing. And one of the emotions obviously is it's clobbering time. You know, he's <laughs> ready to go kick some butt. But the other emotion is when Alicia Masters comes up to him and touches his face. She, she's the blind girl in the, mm. in the in the Marvel comic and in our film. He has to melt. He's got to show the expression of, of to, 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 you know, like he's so just drawn in to everything that she's doing. The touch of a human hand on his face. We had to get that expression. And man, those guys with a rubber mask and mm-hmm. servo motors placed strategically, three guys standing off camera while we're shooting this stuff, you know, and you could hear the little motors going off in his head, you know, but man, he, this, his expression could change like that, mm-hmm. you know, from, from ready to kick ass to ready to just, just fall in love with somebody. And it was it, it was really they they were just amazing craftsmen those guys really amazing mm. Mm. yeah there's just something that's also so organic about the thing and dr doom in the costuming it just feels organic it feels real it doesn't feel like something that you're trying to make slick it's more about right. what came out of an organism <laughs> right right yeah, Gamma rays. So you were talking about Batman, and yeah. we went to see Batman. Of course, it's you know Tim Burton, brilliant, absolutely brilliant guy. Um, and he did he did this, you know he. I remember reading somewhere, if, I, if I'm not mistaken, he was he was talking about uh, German expressionism mm. as being sort of like the template or the. Or, or the the artistic motivation for the set designs and the lighting and so on and so forth. And if you go back and look at the old films, even as far back as Nosferatu, mm-hmm. I mean, those were all the, the German expressionism, you know, that they, they came up with those wacky angles and the, and the mm-hmm. shadows and the <clears throat> angular painting with know, light. shapes. And it, exactly. Painting with light. And I said, well, look, if, if we, and I was talking to Mick Strawn about that. I said, you know, we're not going to be able to build big sets. We don't have big visual effects. We, but let's try to let's let's try to get enough of a set piece or or or, an, or a feeling from what we're creating to give the audience a, a a sense of of something that's there that's not really there. We put we painted a try to. I mean, we it was like a little bit of. Uh, optical tricks if you will you know we were trying to say okay look if we create this like he built this layer for instance for for uh, the jeweler and mm-hmm. he said well, look i think you know what we'll do is because you know well we want to give some depth in this thing so we the set wasn't that big i mean we were in a little garage you know essentially right. a storage right. a lumber yard where he stored lumber and man the guy did a brilliant job of this and he's so it was a, like making a hole like in the set where the guy falls and he falls through it and just mm-hmm. enough of a little set pieces and everything else would fall off into darkness. But if you establish those set pieces, as we talked about this, said, give a taste of what the feeling is of this thing and let the audiences, the actors and thing move through it will we'll, we'll create something of a greater depth and a greater magnitude from just the hint of the set pieces that we could build in that little small space, but just don't light it up. You know, we talked mm. to Mark Perry. He said, I said, man, let it drop off. Let's talk about, you know, we, you know, it's like when you're using Photoshop now, you know, you take a piece of a face and you, pew, what's behind it, you know, the background can be whatever you want. But in this case, the background had to be darkness, you know, mm-hmm. or a hint of something. We always talked about, you know, foreground, middle ground, background. You know, and just if the placement of of something, whether it's a lit lit set piece or an actor or whatever it may be, 
you can create an illusion that you're in some place that's bigger or more interesting than it really was. And that's what we, that's what's anyway, that was kind of like what we talked about from the very yeah. beginning to try to give this film something a little bit, you know, because look, we were, you know, walk out of the Batman movie and you go, holy shit, you know, <laughs> <laughs> how are we going <laughs> to, you know, look, yeah. look at, look at and, the Gotham, look at Gotham and, and the way he did that. And it's like, wow, you know, but anyway. Yeah, and I remember with uh, thing, scenes like the jeweler going through the lair and things to to steal the jewels, a la Mole Man. Uh, <laughs> yes. Yeah. He, uh, we, he only would shoot him going See one that? way. Yep. Right there. And that's, then in the, that's in the lair. Mm -hmm. uh, wow. Yeah. He'd have him going one way, and then he'd shoot him going the other way, and then he'd shoot him <laughs> going this other way. And we'd all make it seem like, even though it was all the same set, because it was different, because the lighting was a little bit different, and because of the way that they shot it with different angles, it seemed like it was a much bigger space. And Oli and Mark were just so clever with the, with the way they lit that and the way that they designed those shots to try to just give as much scope to this as possible. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely didn't know that those were the same exact ones. Partially because I didn't you know, that's that's the illusion that uh, you pulled off there, which is amazing. Were you the guys told? Film. <laughs> were, were you guys told originally that it was going to be theatrical release or straight to VHS? Like, what was the pitch to you? I mean, I guess I don't know if we were actually told anything. <laughs> we weren't really told anything, but I think we all yeah. assumed it was going to go theatrical, exactly. because it was the Fantastic Four, right? Right? So, right? You know, I mean, exactly. It it was never like this is what's going to happen, but everybody at the studio was very excited. Like this was this was special. Yeah. yeah this yeah. was, you know, even though we weren't given a lot more resources than any other film. This was the film that everybody at the studio, you know, Concord was excited about. Okay, cool. Got it. Yeah. So uh, we have, uh, we'll dive into sort of what happened when the movie was like not released, as well as uh, some other stories after we basically take a break. All right, we have our announcements. This is for both December and January. I thought we would just carry that over since we only have one episode in December that this was going to go to. Uh, so we might as well give some extra time for what we're promoting. But uh, we have our own uh, new stuff to, to promote. So for those who met me over at LA Comic Con uh, or listened to the Geekscape episode that I was on, I'm promoting Alter Ego, which is an independent comic that I've been working on for a bit. Uh, you can check out the preview. The first five pages are up on my website. That is benwanrider.com slash alter dash ego dash preview. It is essentially a world ruled over by five families of supervillains. The main character is a supposedly a henchman who works for them, but in reality, he's working undercover to bring everyone down. And when he does that, is he going to step in and save the city or is he going to take over the throne and become a supervillain himself? You don't know. Even he doesn't know yet. So it's kind of playing around with who's a villain and who's a hero. Uh, so that's Alter Ego. You can check it out at the preview and um, you can check out the link that's provided in the description. Uh, also for Nuverse Creative for Christmas, we have Chris, uh, Batman White Christmas. This is an adaptation, an audio adaptation that I wrote uh, based off of the Batman holiday special comic uh, that was written by Paul Dini that had Batman versus Mr. Freeze. It is the one story in that comic that was not adapted uh, into the animated series episode Holiday Nights. So we decided we would adapt it over at Newverse Creative as the uh, Christmas special for them. So check that out over at Newverse. And then over to Andrew. Oh man, we got a date guys for Gaming Gaiden. So Sweet. it's uh, January 9th, we'll start out our nine no 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 ten ten episodes <laughs> see ten episode season uh season two gaming guidance done in seasons and uh it's my video game podcast along with mike torres uh the co-host of that one and it's mainly retro gaming but also the the uh you know japanese to english translation there's less of that in this season actually we do talk about it a little bit but 
um, you know, we, we, in the first season, we did interview a lot of Japanese to English translators for video in the video gaming world. So check out the first season if you're inter interested in that. Uh, but this one's still, of course, about gaming. Uh, and you'll see. And we have some great interviews. Uh, some people um, are pretty well known, actually, in the gaming world, which is, which is uh, great. Uh, more on that later. But uh, it'll be coming out on Tuesdays for 10 Tuesdays in a row, uh, starting January 9th. So stay tuned for that. Gaiden spelled G-A-I-D-E-N. Like nin nice. P I grew up saying Ninja Gaiden too before I learned Japanese, but it is Gaiden. The, mm -hmm. ga the Ninja Gaiden is a famous, uh, famous video game. So our n our name is sort of connected with all of that. So uh, anyway, sweet. And then Metal Force. So Metal www.metalforce.ninja. It's essentially R-rated Power Rangers meet Stranger Things. We are going to do another crowdfunding campaign on Seed and Spark. That is coming soon. I don't have an exact date for that yet, but should be soon as of this episode's release. We did a Kickstarter. We got some funding there, and we want to try one more before we go out and shoot again. So please check that out. Uh, we are definitely still working on it, and uh, it's going to happen. It's just it takes a while. But yeah, um, if you like you know, bloody horror. If you'd like bloody horror Power Rangers mi mixed with Stranger Things and X-Files and things like that, aliens and stuff, then uh, check it out. Nice. All right. And then for our charity for both <clears throat> December and January, which ties into our upcoming January episodes or current January episodes, depending on what you're listening to right now. Um, ours, uh, our charity that we're promoting, not ours, but the charity we're promoting is the GoFundMe for stuntman Carl Charfalio, who was the first actor to don the costume of The Thing, the prosthetics, I should say, for The Thing, for the 1994 Fantastic Four movie produced by Roger Corman that was unreleased, but uh, kind of took on a life of its own years later. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, uh, the on the according to the GoFundMe, his, uh, his years of, uh, <clears throat> it says, pounding the ground as a stuntman, Caught up with our beloved stunt brother, he has experienced a cumulative traumatic spine injury that has robbed him of his ability to move on his own. So, unfortunately, he's in need of a lot of help, especially in physical therapy. And uh, I figured, especially considering that we're going to be talking a lot about that Fantastic Four movie, uh, the least we could do is help promote his GoFundMe to help uh, other people bring in more funds to help Carl out. So, uh, that's over at GoFundMe.com slash F slash Stuntman. Uh, <clears throat> hyphen Carl, hyphen Charfalio, hyphen medical, hyphen fundraiser. Uh, and uh, hopefully you can help out with uh, him and the family for that. Yeah, it's crazy what these stunt guys, stunt men and women go through, everybody. So um, as you can see, some pay a higher price than others. And uh, yeah, if you could help out, that'd be great. Link in description as Ben has said already. Mm -hmm. All right. And uh, with that, that is the announcements. So thank you. How I got these scars? You can find that out on Superhero Stuff You Should Know, where two jackasses on the internet talk about Sneaker Man and other super lame superheroes. By the way, the Batman must die. All right, uh, we are back, and uh, we basically just came back from the break. One of the things that we do, I'm, I'm letting uh, Olia and Glenn know that... Um, one of the ads that we do per month uh, is we sort of have our own announcements, and one of those is a, uh, a sort of charity uh, of our choosing. It's not anything that we're affiliated with, but um, it recently came to our attention uh, that there's a GoFundMe for a Carl. Uh, do you pronounce it Charfalio? Yes. Okay. Carl uh, yeah. Yeah. For um, for his health re for his health stuff. So uh, we've been promoting that GoFundMe. That's going in this episode. It's also going into the other episodes with uh, our upcoming interviews with uh, Joseph Culp and Greg Nevius. So uh, hopefully our, our fans can uh, step up and help out with that. That's fantastic. It'd be great. It'd be really great. Such so, a beautiful guy, I'll tell you. He's a wonderful guy. So, uh, and, uh, you know, obviously we wish him the best of luck and uh, yes. our support. So uh, I think going in, we have, uh, oh yeah, this, this question, Andrew. 
with okay me. yeah uh <laughs> sorry yeah also real quick glenn i'm sorry we never got to, if you were a comic book fan before or not i think uh we got caught up in the conversation so i was a fan but i wouldn't i wasn't a super fan okay got it. i became much more of a fan after having worked with Oli and having worked on the fantastic four before i i was a cinephile i was really into okay. especially american cinema in the 70s like the dog day afternoons and the okay. french connections and and all the that whole period of time in the in the mid 70s that was my jam okay got uh, it. but i was into comic books it's just not like i would collect them and and go buy them and i i was especially drawn to spider-man as well right but uh, I've become much more of a fan over time, just having been in this world and just seen the love, uh, that people have for these characters. Okay, cool. Got it. Uh, and okay. So it's said in the documentary that the movie was filmed on a recycled set from the other Roger Corman film, Carnosaur. Could you go into how the experience, how that experience was filming on that kind of use set uh well you know that's that's probably more of a question for mick strawn you know the production designer because okay you know we we walked it but look it, we we had to have something built and and in a weird way it's like you know we we're glad that something was actually there that we could use mm, <laughs> um, right. you know because we didn't have time or money to build anything and you know, Mick Strong was said, "Hey, was uh, handed that that whole set and said, you know, and then he called me up and he said, you got to come over to the stage and tell you what I have in mind." And we walked in. We said, "Okay, well," I said, "What do you think?" And he said, "Well, you know, we'll repaint it. We'll we'll put some 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 beams of light f flashing through it. We'll we'll build the ray gun and we'll we'll build it and put it right in the middle of this space and we'll change the texture of the walls a little bit." And voila, there we had it. We had Doom's Lair. You know, we had a we had a set to shoot on. And um, yeah, I mean, looking at the big budgeted movies, obviously it, it's. But you know, I think once again, going back to the, I don't, I'm not gonna not gonna make any excuses for it. It's it was a recycled set. It's low budget. Mm -hmm. But regardless, I I think you know that we. We had to work with what we had, you know, and we we just we tried to turn this into the essence of what, you know, it, it's even though we couldn't say, wow, look at Dr. Doom's place. It's just it's incredible. It's it's got all this, you know, it's got all this equipment and it's got this big view of the, you know, the mountains outside or whatever. And <laughs> I, I think, it, you know, I, you know, I come I come from theater and I did some black box theater. And I even did black box theater at uh, the, the Magnolia Theater on Burbank Boulevard before they tore it down. Um, and we would direct one acts. And, you know, what do you have on a stage? You got a, you got a black box, literally, and you've got, you know, maybe a card table and two folding chairs if you need them for actors to sit down and have a scene. And that's it. And... Right. But the but the thing is, if you've got good actors, you've got good dialogue, you've got good lighting, you know, like we had, we had all of, all of the, we had the good actors, we had the good character costumes, we had the lights, you know, who's who's gives a shit about the back wall, you know? <laughs> We're not, they're not hopeful. If they're looking at the set and looking at the wall, then we failed, yeah. you know. They have to yeah. be looking at the at the characters and listening to what they're saying, and. Yeah, we, we, we could do a couple wide shots. And if we had CGI, you know, the way they have today, yeah, I could have created an incredible world from one one back the camera up, you know, a little bit and shoot off the set and paint the whole world in there off, you know, with right. all around. But right, right, right. But we didn't. Yeah. And, and it's the go ahead, Glenn. Go ahead. Oh, you finish. And no, I'm I'll... just saying it's but it, it, in any movie. You establish a wide shot on a on a magnificent set. You put that in the audience's head. You don't hold on it for more than two or three seconds. 
you know, especially today's film is like everything is cut, 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 cut. Mm-hmm. And the next thing you know, you're in, you're in close ups, medium shots, cowboys or whatever. And who's looking at the set then? They're looking into the eyes of an actor, mm-hmm. the listening yeah, the to key, the dialogue. The key is the, the eyes. You know, yeah. if you're believing yeah. what's, what's going on here, you get into that character's psyche. And, you know, once you've established the world, then you want to be close. You want to be inside the character's head. You want to feel what the characters are feeling. And right. the thing about those sets, Roger was doing movie after movie after movie. So every every set was a recycled set from the previous, right, right, right. Mm-hmm. previous film. So it was sort of like, Carnosaur came before the Fantastic Four, so and then somebody I'm sure took the Fantastic Four. I think I think I remember Fantastic Four sets were in like probably eight other Foreman <laughs> films after that. They just were painted differently and yeah. they moved this here, moved that there. The one thing Truly. that Oli did definitely try to do is he tried to do whatever he could to get the characters off the set, though. Like mm. he you know, we uh. went to a university and we shot, you know, some stuff at a university. We 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 went out <laughs> on location to get that grass where, you know, the, the spaceship went. crashes and stuff like that. Mm. Oli was always trying to think of, like, how can we get outside these sets? And then time, th- there were other times that you just had to be on those sets. And that's when that French expression, I mean, that German expressionistic lighting came in. And that's when, mm. you know, we needed to create the depth with the dark shadows and, and things like that. And mm. paint, painting with light, like Oli said. But essentially, once once you're, you've established that, it's really key to get close, to get inside the, these, these people's faces. Mm-hmm. And that's yeah. why it was so important that Doom's costume was good and that the Thing's costume was good and that you could see their eyes, mm. you know? Yeah, that is important. Those actors, to be able to give you expressions and feelings with their eyes, just having just that, not being able to have anything else showing, that is well, it, an it, incredible it, 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 challenge it, it, for an actor you say that glenn because the, the before i i showed the whole full mask of doom i started out with we put a, a slash of light that's right on one side on the mask mm-hmm. and all you yep. do see is an eye <laughs> to, yeah. to exactly what like those mean. shots yeah yeah and, see, but when you establish then, that you're looking you're looking for that because he pointed you in that direction. That's the that's the treasure map that he, he yeah. that only established. But we did that to set up the the, the reveal, you know? Didn't want to mm-hmm. just come right out and shoot a, a big wide shot of his face mm-hmm. or the whole mask. Right, right. And right, the first right. time you see him. You you want to we, we, we wanted to create Tease a it. little mis- a mystery around the mm-hmm. around who this character is and oh 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 and the audience obviously knows what Doctor Doom looks like. But it's kind of fun, you know, if you say, here's Dr. Doom's eye and there's his mouth and there's a little bit more Mm -hmm. of him. And then finally, at at the right moment in the film, you reveal, you know, Dr. Doom and all his glory. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Fun stuff. Yeah, definitely. You know, it's it's interesting, too, because uh, in in talking about the sets, because recently, I think Sir Patrick Stewart talked about how. Um, when he shot recently, he was disappointed and basically it was him surrounded by green screen with like nothing to react to. And so it's interesting to be like, well, it looks great for the audience, but for the actor's perspective, he doesn't really know what he's reacting to. He's just basically got the imagination, it go up to, up to his imagination, but at least, you know, recycled set or not, on the set of this one, as well as other, you know, Corman productions and stuff, this is like, it's, a ta- it's something tangible. It's something yeah. that they can actually react to um, in there, in, in that moment. And also important for the eyes, as you were saying, for them to, to have um, genuine reactions to what's going on around them, to feel like they're in that world. Um, so that, that's, that's something that sort of came to mind uh, when you were bringing that up. Is like, well, yeah, technically we do have all these like big budget type stuff, but it's sounding like a lot of actors are really not enjoying the process 
uh, with a lot of the green screen. Um, and uh, with with the set as well, uh, I think one of the main reasons why we wanted to get some stories on this was more on what was said in the documentary about how um, there was a cat who was recruited to help uh, hunt after the mice. Well, what happened was <laughs> we would we would be cutting, and in order there was a there was a rat rat problem, and the rats were in the walls, and we'd have. These sound sound pads on the walls, and you'd see furniture these, pads, like furniture, these furniture pads. pads, and you'd see like these <laughs> these like little indentations running around. And so Roger went to the pound and got this cat that we called Lucy, and Lucy was sort of the mascot of post production. Uh, oh, only shit. knows. And, yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> uh, and and. I remember once Roger got really upset because Lucy stopped catching ma- mice because people were feeding her so well. He's like, don't feed Lucy. She's supposed to catch the rats. And I would sometimes come to my movie, Ola, Jesus Christ. and she would have brought me a gift because Lucy loved me. And so I'd have this half eaten rat or, or bird sitting out in front of my movie, Ola. And I'd be like, oh, thank you so much, Lucy. <laughs> I need to get to work. And it was like sitting right in front of my my two my petals on my moviola. And I remember once Lucy was in there and she brought this me this rat and she was just playing with it while I was cutting. And the rat was not quite dead. So the rat oh would start God. to scurry away, and then Lucy would grab it and go. <laughs> and then the rat would be like that and then it'd start to scurry away and Jeez. she'd grab it and then after a while it just stopped moving so she'd just doing that to see if it would still move and then she ate it but that, that that's that's the kind of things that we were doing at roger corman i mean <laughs> it was very inventive amazing you know <laughs> Well, the cameras were old, and the film, he never, I don't think uh, he ever had a, 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 a an emulsion number that matched, you know, more than two or three reels. He would just, <laughs> we, would, we would do, we would shoot short ends and recans, you know? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, my God. So, my next question is sort of the big one that we've been leading up yeah. to, and I know we've been yeah. hitting it with, which is uh, basically share your experiences of learning that this movie was not going to be released and the reasons why. Uh, You know, I guess I I was living in denial. I didn't want to believe that this film was going to get, you know, pulled or canned until I finally got the phone call from Roger driving somewhere in LA. And uh, he called me and he just said, you know, Oli, we're not going to, we're not going to release the movie. Um, they paid me a million dollars not to release the film, and but I wanted to call you and tell you personally and thank you for doing a great job. Oh man, this was and sorry, that was, and that Twitter. was the end of it. And it wasn't like I, I was waiting, you know, for him to say, and you know, we're gonna pay you and <laughs> the you know the head of the department. You know, but I but I could I could see now back then it, it really wouldn't have been. But then, you, then, then where does that end? You know, it's like, how much is that person supposed to get? How much is this person supposed to get? Mm-hmm. You know, it, it is what it is. And um, and I love Roger. Roger's, you know, he, he, he's given so many people an opportunity to, to get a break in this business. But that's that's what it was for me. He just called me one day out and said it was over. It was done. For, for, the film's not going to get released. But then, yeah. Glenn, you tell him your, your story. And then we can tell him how we what we did after that. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, the thing is, building up to that moment, it started gaining all this momentum. And the movie turned out better than anyone could have thought. And Roger was excited. And he, I don't know if it was because he was being very clever or what, but he, he was talking about he was going to put make this the biggest release ever of any Corman film, put it in like 750 theaters or, or something like that. Just really, he was, he was really proud of it. And 
really wanted to put it out there. And I don't know, but I'm assuming that they started to get nervous as far as like what we later discovered was the main reason to make the movie was to keep the rights. Mm. New Constantine had the rights and they had to make the movie. They had to start the movie at a certain point and release a movie at a certain, or finish the movie at a certain point in order to retain the rights. And I think the attitude was if they could retain the rights, then they could make a much bigger movie. And we had made a really good movie, but for, I think the idea was, I think new Constantine was going to put in $750,000 and Roger was going to put in $750,000. I think Roger basically took the 750,000 and put it into goods and services. And so I don't, it probably came out to be more like 200,000 or something like that. It was, you know, but we pretty much made the movie for under a million dollars, but if Marvel's going to then release a $50 million version, what that, what is this smaller version going to do to that? And so I think that it started becoming apparent to Marvel and new Constantine, we need to stop this from getting out there. Mm. And I think that that's when Ole got the call and then Ole, you know, he just got drunk under his arm and he's like, (laughs) Glenn, this is, this is what they're talking about. And it was, it was really hard because we put our heart and soul into it. We, I mean, we haven't really gotten into the visual effects, but we spent months and months and months in post-production on this baby. And we, 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 the actors had worked so hard. Everybody had just, just killed themselves to make this beautiful piece that we were as proud of as we could be for the budget that we had. Yeah. And now it was being taken away from us. And so then... Oli, take it away. Well, a- after we realized they were going to take the movie away from us and not even allow us to have a copy of it, you know, to show people, you know, that's how you get work in, in Hollywood. You know, you say, well, what's the last job you've done? You know, well, mm-hmm. we did this. And, well, let's see it. Well, where is it? Well, they took it away from us. Oh, so you don't have a movie. Well, we, we thought we had a movie, but... Oh, and then, you know, it just makes everything look strange and people say, okay, fine. Goodbye. You know, you why wasn't it good shows. enough to be released? What's, what's, what's yeah, that? All like? that. Yeah. Right, so, right. so, so Glenn and I con- conspired to go and, and steal or borrow the, the <laughs> borrow. It, well, I mean, I, look, we saw, I saw an answer print. We saw an answer print of the film at photo camp and wow, man, the film, when you looked at the film, it's like, wow, this this looks good. This movie mm. looks pretty damn good. And I know the vi- yeah. visual effects that the were shit, but you know, it still looked the good. The Worst Brothers had done an amazing job with the music. Oh my god, the music uh, is yeah. fabulous. Great song. Music, the fabulous. music was fabulous. We had those NASA oh. shots that we had pulled for the beginning. That you know, maybe it's a little cheesy, but we went to NASA and we got all their you know all their shots of, of yeah, well, different, Glenn, that uh, was you, man. Glenn did so much on this movie. I can't tell you guys how, how much, how lucky not only uh, I, I was, but everybody that made this movie and worked on it, we were so lucky to have Glenn. Mm. I mean, Glenn was tireless. We even went to, to make another movie for a different company and we'd be editing over there the film that I was doing for those guys. And when everybody left the production office, we would take out the, the, the elements from the fantastic four to finish it on a mm-hmm. flatbed on, on somebody else's dime, you know, yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, so we, it's, it's, we yeah. did that. You're still you trying to get, it. we were still getting visual effects. So, yeah. you know, Isn't that crazy, man, <laughs> because yeah. we, yeah. we had That's gone awesome, with though. another visual effects company that, was not doing it and mr (laughs) film came in and they were they were champions of the movie they were fantastic but yeah you know we had been sold 
a, a, a very bad bill of goods by this other other character. Yeah. And uh, so what we did is we went and we asked if we could just borrow a print of the movie just so that we had it ourselves, mm. just so we okay. had something that we put all this love into that we could share just with the actors, just with the people who worked on it. And so we oh. just got, we were given it for an evening mm. and only brought it to lightning dubs, I think. <laughs> yeah, they gave us a, Mike Elliott gave me a three quarter inch copy. Okay. Which is, and which is like in those days there was two inches. So three quarter inch, you know, is not the best quality, but it's, it's what we could get. Okay. So we and dubbed. It was a, the I think it was quarter. a straight, yeah, straight transfer off the print, and not off the negative. You know, back then they had a telecine machine where you could go straight off the negative, you know, and really get a and and even if you had a had a really good colorist to sit there with the answer print, you know, you could get a, a really decent copy of the movie, but none of that happened. Okay. Um, but but Glenn and I literally went into what was known as, uh, I guess, Roger's Film Vault, which was a storage room in the back of the lumber yard there. And we went in there looking for a copy of the movie, but we never found it. I mean, okay. we were going to yeah. pinch it and take it over to, to you know, to, uh, uh, you know, uh, one of these uh, places that we could do a, a really decent transfer. Proper of the film. telecine, yeah. Yeah, a good proper telecine of the film. But there was no film... To, to, to even borrow, you know, we yeah. couldn't, nothing to find. But anyway, we got the three quarter inch and we got a, a copy of the film. And luckily somebody who was working at lightning dubs decided to bump a few copies for themselves. And that's what's <laughs> out there in the world, <laughs> because, you know, and, and that's what we try to keep telling fans out there is that, yeah, the movie looks bad because it's a copy of a VHS to a VHS to a VHS, you know, it's because somebody just, Luckily, you know, decided to drop a copy and you know for themselves, and yeah, and that's how it got out there. Were you yeah, told we were, it was we were uh, surprised uh, when weird. it when it started popping up? <laughs> I went to Oli. I'm like, how did this get out? And, Oli was like, oh, no. <laughs> and, and, and I think we all thought, well, who? How did you know? And I think it was just at that time. Lightning Dubs was known as this place where you'd have these night guys, <laughs> and this night guy was probably making a copy, and he he saw it. He's like, "Oh, this is cool. I'll make myself a couple copies." <laughs> and then you know, lo and behold, it becomes this huge cult thing at mm -hmm. uh, the different comic book conventions. Yeah, and it's the truth, man. Were you guys told it was like gonna be canned? before you even finished making the film or it was definitely totally a hundred percent done. And then you were told they waited until out. it was done. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Which was weird, isn't it? Yeah. yeah and I, 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 I think probably Glenn, I think that they, they, because we were all kind of working <laughs> under the radar, uh, Jan, um, from, from post, you know, I don't think they even knew that. I don't even know if Roger knew that we were still trying to finish the movie. And all of a sudden, we we there was a finished movie. I mean, yeah, I, I don't know unless you know something different. You know, Jan was like sneaking in the art. We go out, for instance, and shoot that stuff of the thing running around in the street, and she would send it into the lab on on another film. You know, I mean, it was yeah. kind, of, kind of like I don't we, think they thought we were going to we, finish the movie. No, I don't know. and we, nobody told us to not finish it. This, the whole damn thing was so weird. <laughs> I mean, nobody told us not to finish the movie. Right, right, right. And they right. didn't. They weren't like on a deadline anymore, apparently. And you could step in any time, Glenn. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I we never got a sense that anybody really cared whether we finished the movie or not. But we were well, just. I, I, I mean, do know that we needed to finish. This was the big thing: is that we had we had to finish before the end of the year. That we had to shoot the film before the end of the year, for sure. Shoot the film before, but we had to actually finish the movie before the end of the next year. Uh, oh, yeah. Remember, oh yeah, right. I remember <laughs> that. 
Yes. Right, right, right. So we had a year to do it. Okay. Once once Ole had had finished shooting before the end of the year or finished or had started shooting before the end of the year, then we had a year to get it done and you know, I'll just go into it. We we started turning over visual effects to this person named Scott Billups. And he had worked on some big movies and I don't think he was the supervising visual effects person. I think he had done some visual effects and we thought, okay, this is, he seems good. He talked a great game. And then after we kept calling him saying, when do we get to see stuff? And he's like, oh, another couple of weeks. It's almost ready. Oh, I got, it's going great. You just wait. And then at one point, Ole's like, okay, we're just going to show up at this guy's house. <laughs> and I think I think we jumped into Oli's car and we drove to the guy's house and knocked on the door and Scott was like, Oh, Oli, Glenn, Glenn, what are you doing here? And we're like, We're here to see some visual effects because it's been like two months and we haven't seen shit. Right. Yeah. And oh, yeah. and Scott introduced us to this woman who was in the back room who he said was doing a bunch of visual effects for us. And she seemed like she was the person who was doing everything. And he showed us like two, maybe three half, half ass shots. Yeah, and Oli's like, Oh shit, yeah. we're in trouble. Yeah, and so we then sort of regrouped and we were trying to figure out what to do, continuing to have Scott do, do his stuff. And I think that, I don't know how we found uh, Mr. Film and what was his name again? He was that. great. It's in the, it's in the book. But um, Mr. Film, the guy who ran it, he loved the characters and we had no money because we had already paid Scott. Right. Yeah. And so Mr. Film, we, I think we had a little bit of extra money that, that Oli had begged, borrowed, and st stole to get yeah, to Mr. Yeah, Film. Yeah. And then Mr. Film went and he did as much as he possibly could. And he did a, as good of a job as he could. But, you know, this was 1994. He maybe had like ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 to do everything. Yeah. And so he did as good as he could, but it, it became almost like, animated with you know the fire looked animated the you know the flame you know it it's animated so we he did as much as he possibly could but you know that's that's what we ended up with yeah. uh geez it seems like yeah. there was some sentiment like there probably was a sentiment anyway if you showed it to roger corman or whoever was in the mix there I just imagine people were like, wait, 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 wait. You guys actually made a good one? We weren't expecting this. Well, <laughs> Roger know? did see it. Yeah. So, I don't know if yeah. he saw it completely mixed and finished and color corrected, but he had seen it. Yeah. And that's why he was talking about like putting it in a bunch of theaters. Okay. Yeah. 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 I mean, you know, I think he, I, I think he even said in the Hollywood Reporter that, you know, he planned to put it in a ton of theaters. Yeah, and yeah. you know they cut a, they made a really good trailer. They the did. Trailer. You that. should look at if, if you get a copy of the trailer. Um, I think it's out there. I have a copy of it. If you can't find it, it's a few on um, YouTube. I think I, the trailer was the I think the only film that was was transferred via telecine because it looks amazing. I don't know what they did, but boy, it looks great. The trailer looked great, and um. They were going to do a, a big premiere at the Mall of the Americas. Mm. And it was uh, going to be fantastic four day. And it was a big deal. Mm. Um, so they, I, so at some point, Roger, like Glenn said earlier, that, you know, Roger saw the film and said he was proud of it. And therefore started this campaign to get the film out there. Because apparently, you know, they, they hired Roger to make a movie, but they didn't tell him he couldn't release it. 
Yeah. yeah. So yeah. he had a movie and he said, well, hey, it's not my contract. I can do right. whatever the hell I want with it now. It's, it's my movie. Mm-hmm. And he was going to release it. Uh, and, I, and that's when he, yeah. he got paid not to release the off. film. Yeah. Got it. Gotcha. And uh, Fangoria had a great spread. There were a bunch yeah, of yeah. Yeah, really spread. good spreads that people were excited. And yeah. I think yeah. that made you well, know the some of the people the, yeah. nervous. At the comic book comic comic book convention at the Shrine Auditorium okay. in downtown yeah. LA. And they we had a, a a screening of the of I don't remember, Glenn, what was it a uh, did you cut together a five minute piece or a ten minute piece or something? We showed something. I think we at, showed something. Yeah. At the at the Shrine Auditorium and the line was around the it around was, the block. Yeah, it was crazy. Yeah. Was I, a, I think oh, we, we pulled a few different, you know, great, selects. Yeah. And and then we had a question and answer with the cast and mm. wow, it was it was like, wow, this is this was really happening, man. It was great. It was really. I, I think that even uh, Alex, you know, I think a bunch of the cast were, were actually going to be sent on going around the country and yeah, start a junket. doing right. a junket. Right. right so right. there was, as far as everybody knew, this movie was going to be released. Mm-hmm. Right. Okay. And then when Oli got that call, it was just like the, you know, somebody popped the balloon. Oh yeah, yeah. Exactly. on the big car phone. And we have no idea, <laughs> like, whether that print is in a vault someplace. Mm. You know, it's like the end of Indiana Jones. You know, it's like <laughs> in some <laughs> universe. I mean, Disney Plus would do well to just restore it and put it on Disney Plus at least. Thank you. You know, and that's, there is what we're doing, and I, I can talk about it because please do with Craig Nivius and Joseph Culp, and when, when they all got together with Glenn and all of us got together for the most recent LA Comic Con. We sat down and we said, look, man, let's just try to do something. And Joseph has uh, written a draft letter that's an open letter to Marvel and Disney. And we're editing that letter right now. And we're going to we're going to push on trying to get exactly, brother. We're, we're going to just, <laughs> you know, throw it in their face and say, <laughs> because, you know, Drew, exactly what you said, man. We, what we'd love for them to do is you release, the, clean up the, just get a good clean copy of the original yeah. film and then spend a little bit of money on some visual effects to yeah. update the film. And could you, they could screen it one way or the other, however they want to do it, the powers that be. They always seem to know better. But, you know, you get, <laughs> you, get you know, they could release it on a, a, a double DVD, a double set, or download it, you know, like the original Here's the original, and here's the, the latest version. But like you said, Disney Plus or whatever, they, I mean, they, the movie would make a lot of money, I think, you know, because of the fan base out there. And, uh, and people uh, know about it. People have seen it. Yeah. So oh, hell yeah. Might as well have a good version, <clears throat> not something that's a dub of a dub of a dub of a dub mm-hmm. of a dub. And yeah. the thing is, a lot of people, I'm not just saying this myself, a lot of people feel that. It's their favorite of the Fantastic Four films. It, yeah, so, yeah. You know, so, Glenn. It's if you look at the look at what the fans say online, and and there's one or two. There's a few bad. You know, oh, like <laughs> shit. It's terrible. There always but is. Yeah. Majority. The majority. I would say ninety to ninety-five percent of every comment out there is that this film is better. We love this movie. It's this. It's that. And. I, I think I told a story before, um, but I'll say it for now for, mm-hmm. for your show. When Robert Kultzer, who still works at Constantine Film right now, and, I, and Robert and I have, are still good friends. And because I went back to see him, you know, a few years ago, and he, he said to me, he said, Oh, Oli, I, I, I thought you hated my guts. I said, <laughs> I said, Oh, I said, look, man, it was it, it wasn't your fault. And Bant Eichinger, 
inviting me to his house in Beverly Hills to tell me personally what was happening and why the whole thing got pulled and, and so on and so forth. But Robert told me when I saw him a few years ago, and he did not have to tell me this, that he and Bernd Eichinger were walking out of the screening room at Fox. And he, Robert told me and was dead serious in all sincerity, Bernd Eichinger turned to Robert and said, Oli's version is better. <laughs> because it is. That's awesome. Boom. Yeah. And I went, I'm telling you, man, I'm sitting in Robert's office at Constantine Film, and I'm damn near broke into tears. Yeah. Because it was so pent up in me for years. And that, and for to hear the guy who was the head of the company who unfortunately died of a heart attack. Um, mm. Wow. To tell Robert to tell me that was like, he didn't have to tell me that. And it was yeah. just, I said, wow, you know, there's a little bit of vindication that, the, the guy that was, he, and you know, they still own the rights to the Fantastic Four. New Constantine still owns the rights. So oh. they're involved in every one of these movies. On some oh, level. wow. But, yeah, it was, that was the whole purpose of them making this movie to keep the rights. Yeah. And they did it. They were, they were going to lose the rights. They, they had to make the movie. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I think that. Oli and the actors just there there was just so much heart and soul put into this movie and that's too, why Glenn, from I think it turned out from everybody and I think everybody. That that's why I think that that's why I think people can feel it when they watch the movie they can feel that there was love yeah that that this was made with love yeah. and I don't know what would have happened to some of these actors had this movie come out you know, yeah, it, that's what's unfortunate. It's like everybody, you know, it would have, I think, really been helpful to everyone's career. Totally. If this had been released. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the good yeah. thing is I got to be really good friends with Stan Lee. OK. And I'll tell you, before before all the big Marvel movies came out, I was hanging out with Stan over at his office on Wilshire Boulevard and at the Marvel office and couple stories. One, one is that he pulled out an old comic book that he had called the Femazons that was unpublished. And he said, I said, well, let's, Hey man, what do you want to do with this? He says, I want to like to, let's turn this into, cause I'd already done Xena and Hercules for yeah. Sam Raimi. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, let's go pitch it, Stan. What do you think? And he goes, yeah, let's go do it. Let's come on, man. So I, here I am with, with Stan Lee. We went to universal television, Paramount, um, Warner Brothers, and with that comic book in our hand, with Stan Lee face to face with these executives, and every one of them turned us down. Mm. They all were excited to meet Stan mm. Lee, but that was it. And Stan and I, <laughs> after weeks or a couple months of this, we're sitting at a restaurant in Westwood, and here's the great Stan Lee sitting there at a restaurant with me in Westwood, and bemoaning the fact that nobody wants to make movies of his comics. <laughs> I'm not kidding. And then every yeah, time this yeah. was before, and before the, all of the big ones. Yeah. I mean, can you, can you believe that? And it's like, so this is how close I was to Stan. And yeah. he was, you know, and, and anyway, that it was, it's kind of amazing that, and Stan Lee, for whatever he said after the fact, you know, about us in the film. Uh, you know, he came to the set. He brought donuts to the set mm. one morning. He, we, while we're shooting downtown outside the exterior of the Fantastic Four building, and Stanley shows up and he's got a box of donuts. <laughs> it's really That's cool. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah he, he was, was really excited. Good. He was excited about this movie. Yeah. Did he have any input on the script at all, or do you know uh, of anything? He did, like that? in fact. Yeah, <clears throat> he oh. did. There was a, a letter that, where the hell is it? Um, Craig Nebius just sent me a copy of this letter. All right, so we have the letter yeah. that uh, was sent to Roger Corman, right? Yep. And it is a oh, story oh, outline yep. co written by Stan Lee. That's awesome. I'm glad I asked. <laughs> yeah. It, it, isn't that something, man? Yeah, it's awesome. That's amazing. Yeah. 
So we had the man himself, you know, involved mm-hmm. in this project. Yeah, that's great. Before we started shooting. That's, that's so cool. cool. So, yeah. So, uh, one of my last questions is something where history kind of repeated itself, which I'm sure you've heard about back in 2022. Warner Brothers Discovery pulled the plug on Batgirl for a yeah. tax write-off. Uh, which also sparked a new trend of canceling finished movies for tax purposes. There was also Scoob Holiday Haunt, uh, Coyote versus Acme more recently. Uh, the Batgirl film was, funny enough, connected to the 89 Batman movie that we were talking about earlier. It also had Michael Keaton's Batman. And uh, apparently one of the directors, there were two, but one of the directors was getting married when the news hit that uh, it was getting canceled. Oh, no, I didn't know oh, that part. So, oh, my God. I didn't God. know that part. Yeah. Brutal. So, get the honeymoon, dear. <laughs> we got to save just, some money. <laughs> just brutal. Uh, so, <laughs> that said, uh, do you see Batgirl? I'm, I'm sure you do, as sort of a kindred spirit to Fantastic Four, given that these are two superhero movies, finished Ooh. production, not officially released due to things outside of you know their control. Well, you want to comment about that? Yeah, like basically. Well, the comp- well, the, well the, 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 <laughs> they did it for for uh, the for purposes of uh, saving money. Mm-hmm. I mean, the, the, it's 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 not really a a, a real e- equivalent because you know our it's film different. was pulled from us mm-hmm. because they just didn't want it released. It it would hurt their chances to to, to you know. I, I mean, knowing that our film was made for contractual obligation only, mm. and you know, what did we, like Glenn said, we're under a million dollars. What if Batgirl was 90 million? 90 or something. Yeah, yeah. yeah 90 million dollars. Mm-hmm. And they just, they needed a tax, a tax write-off. The, the bean yeah, counters was, over the studio several, needed a yeah. tax write-off. And they, mm-hmm. they said, well, we spend more money on this thing. And I, I mean, who knows what the, what the, the, the thought process was. Mm-hmm. on why they decided to use that particular film as a, as a tax write-off unless the film was just a real piece of shit. And, <laughs> you know, and I'm not knocking the film because I've never seen it and nope, how hard it is to get a movie it. made. And I'm not knocking <laughs> the filmmakers. But yeah, right. Warner Brothers right. obviously didn't have faith in the movie to, to make money. Mm-hmm. And yeah, they thought, I mean, well, from what I heard, because I know some people who've seen it, it it's not bad. It's not great. Yeah. Uh, but you know, it was, it was definitely, you know, watchable and enjoyable. And I think originally it might've only been thought of as something for, uh, Max. Mm -hmm. And then they realized that it would just be more advantageous to put it as a write-off to uh, write it off of their balance sheet because, you know, Warner Brothers at a, at a certain time was having issues with needing money. Mm-hmm. And so it was a, an, an accountant's thing. With ours, I think what the thing was, was it's really good for a million dollars, but is this going to affect if it gets out there and is watched in a big way, is it going to affect when we mm-hmm. do a movie for 50 or 60, or I don't know how right. much the, the first fantastic four movie was, or not the first one, I would say it's the second one. Cause we're the right. original, mm-hmm. but, right, but right, the right. one that the studio did, you know, I think that the, the, the fear was that it would, make that movie harder to put out there. Right. And right. there had already been some issues with uh, like Captain America and some other projects that had been done prior to ours that had not done very well in the Marvel universe. And I think that the fear was that if that, if, if it hurt the Marvel universe anymore, then it might affect them being able to do a big, bigger budgeted movie. Mm. And so I think that that was the main thing was just, it's not that people didn't think the movie was good. It's that they thought that a movie that was done for a million dollars would hurt the chances of making a much bigger budget. Exactly. Mm. That's so crazy. 
Yeah. 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 Well, Glenn, thank you for being methodical and explaining that without all the emotion <laughs> that comes out of my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> I mean that's fun too if you want to. Uh, I, have, I, 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 I have to I have to switch off the Sicilian side of me, man, before I start talking about this. You, you know we are marked as explicit on uh, Spotify. And Apple, yeah, we so are explicit. Yeah, you can we say fuck all you want, Ali. <laughs> Well, fuck Thanks, them. We got to redo this. <laughs> you heard it here first. Well, I feel. Look, I feel really bad. As you know, it's equally as bad for the people that made that movie. Mm -hmm. You yeah. know, the directors and the actors and the wardrobe people and the yeah. editors and the DP and everybody that that you know. Look, you have to be really passionate about the movie business or not the business so much as just making movies and you have to love what you do. You have to love the craft, you know, for the most part, everybody that makes a movie is an artist in their own right. And why are they artists? Because they're passionate about what they're creating. And it's unfortunate that the, the bean counters really don't give a damn about that. And that's fine. That's just the nature of that business has been like that from the beginning of time. And, but it's just a shame you know, I feel bad for anybody that goes through the process of putting their heart and soul into making something and then having it just stomped on by, you know, people that are just not cut from the same cloth. I, I you know, it was like the idea that Avi Arad said that, you know, they destroyed our negative, the, you know, for our film. And I can't believe that anybody would that's in the movie business would, that's sacrilegious. I mean, they would never. Yeah. Yeah. I just don't believe that anybody would destroy the film, the neg the actual negative. It's with the Ark of the Covenant. Exactly. <laughs> <That's>, right. <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I still just believe that that, that somebody that, that somebody's got that negative somewhere. That mm -hmm. that negative has to be tucked away someplace. And that's our our, our hope and that's why we're going to push a little bit, I think, with trying to get, you know, create a little buzz about getting these guys to release that movie you know so mm. okay yeah, for sure that's awesome we only have yeah. a couple more questions here we're winding down pretty much but uh i was just wondering so um ben and i are both filmmakers aspiring filmmakers and i'm working on something myself and i had a question for for both of you guys but i'll start off with with oli first how how do how do you break into directing? Do you just basically make something on your own and then show it yes. at a film festival? And then it's like, have a dinner that night. And they're like, I like that movie. Here's a deal for you to direct the next thing. Is that basically it? That's it. I mean, in a nutshell, <laughs> I mean, okay. I, I'm serious. Look, yeah, yeah. look, I, I know a lot of guys, I know a handful of guys that, you know, and I don't know if you're, if you attend on writing, or, or if you've already written it, but that's always a plus, but yeah. it's not necessary. The, the, if you really want to direct a film, find something that, that you're really passionate about. And look, people out there in that business love to be told what's going to work and not work. I yeah. mean, but primarily what's going to work. And if you get somebody's ear and pitch them, with passion about what it is your vision is for the film. And it's, it's a difficult situation. I'm, I'm doing one right now that we're casting and, you know, finding somebody with, first of all, the money that shares your vision, but you have to convince them of your vision. You have to show them yeah. this is, and I've written scripts. I've had, I'm lucky enough to have a couple of my movies made. One of my movies that I wrote got, got made at Disney, I've okay. made Lifetime movies, a couple films here and there. Um, but the, the point is you create your own material if you've got it. That's going to right away get you a seat at the table. If you can't create it, go find it, option it. Talk to some other you know, young, energetic writer who's looking for a break, and you guys team up and say, okay, I, let's, go, let's, go, let's go pitch this thing, man. Let's the, the, and I think what you have to do is get talent attached. And now Damien Chazelle is an example 
um, made a short film of um, what was the the, the the breakout film he did the, about the Whiplash. Drama. Whiplash. He, he oh, that movie got, fucking ruled. Yeah. He, well, yeah, yeah, but but he he movie. first made a a short version of that exactly okay. with the actor. Gotcha. Simmons, gotcha. With the, with the star that by uh, the film, he went and shot a short film, and you can look you can look it up. Go look at Damien. Just type it in YouTube. Damien Chazelle's short film of, from Whip, Whiplash, and he used that as the sales tool to get somebody to finance the big one, okay. and it launched his career. Steven Soderbergh, who's a, a friend of mine from way back when, um, did Sex Lies and Videotape. Yeah, yeah. You know? And boom, he made that movie for a million bucks. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He wrote it, and then look what happened. He goes, wins the Palm Door, you know, gotcha. and Cannes Film Festival. Crazy. A friend of mine. Tarantino, he, Reservoir Dogs. It, it's, yeah. 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 You, you, you got to have, you know, you've got to have something that's good. Yeah. But if you, if you write something that is really good and that you're passionate about and it 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 speaks to people and you shoot it you got to shoot it and you and and one thing that people don't realize is that post always takes a lot longer and costs a lot more than you ever think because that's that that that's where you really take that time to to craft it and if you can edit it yourself great just get some people who are maybe in the business to give you some outside perspective. But, mm-hmm. you know, nowadays it's a lot easier because the cameras are less expensive. The editing equipment's less expensive. Yeah. You just, you got to go, but you got to do it. Yeah. You got to do it. And then when you do that one, then you got to do the next one because <laughs> you, you can't, you can't just be like, oh, now I'm just going to, like have everyone discover this. You just have to keep doing it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, have have another one in the wings, man. That's a, that's 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 good advice. I've thought of yeah. I, I have thought of that. Yeah. I mean it's all good advice, obviously, but okay, so self fund, good showing at film festival, have a conversation with somebody at the film festival. <laughs> <the> table, yeah. <laughs> okay, I got it. Okay. But the hardest thing is, you know, when you want to get a film made, you you have to get talent. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but if you've got it, look. If you've got a a good project, and there's still like the old school way of making a movie, where you can, like, there's certain elements you can put together. One is you get a a, a distributor or or a foreign sales company that's interested in the project with a particular talent that they they can take that the name of that talent and run the numbers in in foreign territory. And then they will give you a, 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 a breakdown of what that film with that particular actor in that particular genre of a movie is worth in foreign territories. Literally break it down by country. Right. You know, I can we can say it's a guaranteed, you know, a minimum MG, they call it. You get a minimum guarantee of, you know, two million from Germany or I can get a million from France. I can get. Three million in Japan, and yeah. they'll you take that piece. That's that's if it's a legitimate sales agent and a legitimate company. There's banks that will give you loan you a, like eighty percent against that on on you know on the dollar to say okay here go to uh, a bank or or a, a, there's film finance companies out there that will loan you money against that piece of paper. Now it's not usually enough to make the film. So you get, you get, but that's a start. You get that. Then you get, you go to a, 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 a city or a state that has tax credits and you say, okay, I can, I can, I'm going to get 25% or 35% of the budget back on a tax credit. There are people that can, will loan you money against that. And then if you try to, if you, and then if you're still short, you try to get another film finance group out there and they're out there, man. I know who they are. Um, this guy, Walter Yostin from Blue Rider F- Pictures. Look that guy up on, on the internet, okay. on, on, on IMDB, Blue Rider Pictures. His name is on about 20 or 30 movies as an executive producer. Why? Because he gives gap financing. 
you know, okay. but you've got to have, you, you've got to have all these elements have to work together. You're not going to get just, it, it's almost like you're playing one against the other, you, you know, until you get them all to meet in the same room and say, okay, I've got the foreign sales numbers on this film. I've got, you know, uh, the tax credits I can, I can get from this place. And, and so here you are and I need, I need gap. And he said, how much you need? I need a, I need another 500,000 or a million. We did this for a film, um, a few years ago and we literally pre-sold the, the, uh, the, uh, domestic rights up front. And we had okay. what was called a, a kill fee. So we, we, we needed, some, we were just, you know, getting as much as we could wherever. And we had a, a, a company called Wellgo. They, they gave us $500,000 for the domestic rights to the film. But in the contract, we have a kill fee. And the kill fee is $150,000 that if, for instance, we make a really good movie and somebody like Searchlight wants to come in and take the whole world or take domestic, you know, we're going to get a better distribution deal with the Searchlight than we are with a Wellgo. Okay. So the kill fee is, okay, well, we, 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 uh, we're going to make the deal with Searchlight and Searchlight pays Wellgo $150,000 for putting up the $500,000 to begin with. Okay, but against against domestic, against a domestic sale, I mean, obviously, if you spend their five hundred thousand, you you pay that back plus one hundred and fifty thousand. Okay. So I mean, so there's a lot of different ways to 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 get films financed, but the but the hardest thing is getting some good talent and talent that that means something in these in these foreign territories. But you know what? Make a short film about your 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 feature film like Damien Chazelle mm -hmm. did. I mean, I, right. my first film was a short film with Bill Paxton. Okay. You know, That's who, cool. who I met when I was doing music videos. He, okay. he and he and James Cameron walked into our production office in, in Hollywood one day and hired our production company to produce a music video for Bill Paxton that James Cameron directed. Okay. And the, you know, and this is this is well after Aliens and and all the big movies. I mean, James Cameron was a big director. Yeah, you know, yeah. Even then, even then, mm. and I got to be friends with Bill Paxton, and he he did he did the short film that I made, and that that in turn got me my first movie with Roger Corman. That's awesome. Okay. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Got it. About all. Yeah. All right. Well. uh, one uh again winding down but one for glenn now uh going back to fantastic four what was your general approach in editing it was it different from usual did you have any kind of editing what was your editing inspiration was it like old sci-fi films or you know what what was your thought process going into this well for me it's talking to the director mm -hmm. it's reading the script it's seeing what the actors are giving me and then it's just with all those, all that information, just each scene trying to find the heart and soul of, of the characters in that scene. And what is that scene about? You know, what good writing is never people saying exactly what they feel and what they need and what they're <laughs> right. thinking. Right, right, right. People, people are, are lying a lot. And so it's all about reactions. It's all about thoughts. It's all about the subtext. And so with editing, with directing, with writing, it's all about who are these characters? What's the subtext? What do they want? And how can you tell this so that it's clear to the audience, but doesn't spoon feed them? Mm -hmm. And so that's just the approach for, for anything. Okay. Uh, I do know that like when I've got somebody like Oli who gives you a really good blueprint of what they're thinking okay. and tells you like, this is about a dysfunctional family who love each other, who are going to go through this horrible thing together and they're going to have to get through to the other side, even with people that they might have loved and cared about at the beginning. That's a great way to go, okay, now I know how to approach each scene. 
And that's, that's sort of the roadmap that Oli gave me when we started. And okay. it's, it was really clear and a great roadmap. Okay. Well, thank cool. you, Glenn, for saying that. But you really, you know, he, 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 but you have to understand, too, that when Glenn sits there, he's looking at all this raw footage, <laughs> you know, and mm -hmm. he's got the, he's got his, he's, he knows where he's going with it. He knows what he wants to do with it. But he's the one sitting there to, to put the scissors the first time to take the piece that, that relays everything he just said in that moment. And that's, and hats off to you, Glenn, because oh. he's, mm -hmm. he's that, mm -hmm. he's that meticulous and that thoughtful. And I, you know, cause you've been heaping a lot of praise on me in this thing, but I want to tell you, brother, you know, you, 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 you did a, a fabulous job of, of finding the right moments and, and assembling the, those scenes where, you know, that the scenes had, had, you know, heart and soul and a, a beginning, a middle and an end. I mean, you, you, you're, you're just, you're a good filmmaker, man. Good filmmaker. Thank you. Yeah. That's yeah. Awesome. It's, uh, it's, it takes, it takes a whole group of people, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's one of the very few art forms that's a collaborative art form. Yeah. And you really need to find a team of people who are like minded, who have the same passion as you do, who are going in the same direction. And you're always it's always about the story. You know, when you're writing it, it's about the story. When you're coming up with the sets, it's about the story. When the actors are performing it, it's about the story. And when I'm editing it, I'm basically telling a story with images instead of words. I've got images. Right. And so it's basically translating the script and the actors and what they're saying into an, an image representation of what is the essence of that scene. And then Oli comes in and he's like, that's awesome. <laughs> that doesn't really fit with, you know, what I'm thinking. Maybe we can look at some other take. I don't quite buy this. And Oli's the captain of the ship and I'm sort of his first mate. I'm like the, I'm the navigator <laughs> and, and he's the right. captain. So there were no, did you have like any specific films in, in mind or TV shows going or was those, that kind, of, that kind of thought process wasn't really in your mind when editing? No, because I don't want to ever make anything that's derivative. Gotcha. Okay. I know yeah. that I know that Oli did tell me about that uh, Elephant Man scene. Okay, okay. got it. Which you know we did talk about that, and okay. so that was a really good thing to have in my mind. But you know, like I remember when I first worked with Tarantino, or when I first worked with. Alexander Payne, or I worked with uh, Ryan Johnson, wow. or 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 Rob Zombie. All those people. It's it's the key is not it's it's to basically take their voice and make it to 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 echo that voice. Gotcha. It's to take Oli's voice and to echo that. And so it's not really to take somebody else's voice or that film and make it derivative. Gotcha. Okay. That's awesome. Yeah. This one thing I've thought of, like I, I had an epiphany one time about the Jurassic park films. Me personally, I feel like they've all not been great because they've all, the, the, I mean the, yes, the, other than the first one, the sequels have all not been great because they're all trying to be Jurassic park, but the first Jurassic park is great because Spielberg loves dinosaurs. <laughs> There's something different there, right? I think the energy is different. It's, it, it's kind of beyond liking f other films. The other ones, they loved Jurassic Park. That's great. But did you love dinosaurs? That's Maybe I'm off about that, but that's kind of the epiphany I had one time thinking about that film. So uh, you saying that reminded me of that. Um, yeah, I mean, those, those, you know, they're, again, if you watch Jurassic Park really carefully, it's not about all the great big special effects. The special effects were great. Yeah. But yeah. there's what is more 
what is burned in your into your mind more than those two children yeah. hiding in the lab? Yeah, exactly. You know, where you have the raptor in there and you just see their faces and you hear the sound of the raptor. You don't even yeah. have to see it. You just see the tail. Yeah. And that yeah. is is more frightening than seeing teeth like in yeah. in the frame. So, you know, and another story about Jurassic Park, I remember we were talking about Carnosaur. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> Carnosaur was Roger's answer to Jurassic Park. Yeah, and yeah, I remember yeah. Roger going out going, but our dinosaur is bigger. <laughs> <laughs> but still missing something. <laughs> but it didn't have those kids. And, and, and actually, right, Adam right. Simon did a great job with Carnosaur. Yeah. He's a very talented director. But, you know, you can only do so much when you've got 18 days and you're in your 18 it. days. <laughs> how long is principal how photography many, how many for days did we have? I was going to say, man, Fantastic we didn't four. have, I don't think it was much have, more than 18. It wasn't much more than 18 days. It might've been like, Jesus might've been 20, Maybe 20 or 22 or something. Because it was that. big budget. <laughs> <laughs> for Corman's tents. Yeah. It was, we had it a, was huge. It was 20 well, days. We had to go on location. Yeah, oh. we, had to, we had to move the circus to a couple different locations. So that's oh man, that's the extra days. Oh, oh man. my god. Oh, okay, man. Uh, let's see. Oh, my last question's not too too deep, but uh, I definitely saw a preview from Fantastic Four on a VHS I rented one time. Do you remember what that was? I forget. Maybe it was Dark Man or something. But it it was on a VHS as if it wow. was going to be released. That's cool. Somebody else told me that too, but I don't. I, read, that was I, a long I time wish I could ago, see. man. Do you, do you still have that? I'm I'm asking which movie it was because I I swear to you I saw it one time on a, something that I didn't own, but I rented. I oh. think it might have been maybe Dark Man because it, it seems. It might have been Dark Man. I mean, yeah. Oli, you worked. You know, you worked with with Raimi. Sam Raimi, yeah. Uh, do you know if it was around that time I, that Dark I, Man was coming I, out? I don't. Yeah, but it wouldn't have had anything to do with with him directly. It would have okay. It would have probably been on some other Roger. It might have been on some other Roger movie. Maybe it was like, Toxic Avenger or something. I don't know. I, I saw it though. I definitely, but way before the internet, I definitely saw it. So maybe if somebody out there in the comments could, wow. we can get some info and and crowdsource this answer. The the key would be to f try to find out what was released by Roger right before that. Right. right, right, right. Right around that that time, because it would have been he would have taken that trailer and put it onto one of his films. Okay, got it. That makes sense. Yeah, that's yeah. probably most likely. <laughs> I got, I got it. Would be Toxic <laughs> Avenger. Okay. Uh, because that wasn't Roger. Oh, I'm uh, sorry. Sorry, Internet. Sorry, you. I'm sorry, everybody. <laughs> that's trauma. But, that's trauma. That's trauma. Yeah. Yeah. But apologies. But, but I would like look at a filmography of, of nine, 93, 94 the movies that were released around that time. And okay. then you might find it, but okay. the trailer. Yeah. Is great. I, yeah. I believe that that was cut by Roger Davis and, you know, I had cut a lot of trailers for Roger and I, he had Rod, Roderick was very nice to have me come in and, give my two cents and he cut a fantastic trailer. Awesome. And look, and it looked great. Yeah, it did. It looked great. The yeah, trailer awesome. looked real good. Yeah. So thank you both for coming on and sharing your stories. And uh, we'll get this out there to a lot of fans of, you know, of the movie of the characters and, and maybe some who haven't heard these stories before or haven't seen the documentary and uh, please send us the, anything uh, that comes out when it comes to um, the petition to release this. Yeah, yeah, that'd be awesome. Will. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think you know we'll, you're going to hear from us soon about you know this open letter idea. We'll see. Mm -hmm. We may fall flat on our face, but you know it's uh, you know like like that's in their eyeballs, man. We just go out and irritate them a little bit. You know, <laughs> <and> see, <laughs> see what we can do to sh shake the tree. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Also, yeah, yeah it's, uh, it's it's so good to uh, also 
you know, I saw Oli at uh, LA Comic Con, but uh, we don't see yeah. each other as much as we used to, and mm, it's yeah. just it's just really awesome. Well, that's the you thing. Know, you too, you we can re- see how much heart and soul this guy has. Mm-hmm. Mm. Well, and you too, Glenn. And that's the thing that that <laughs> the the one last thing I'm going to say is the entire cast, Glenn, everybody that. We're like a family. We are like the Fantastic Four family. We don't. Yep. We we stuck together for thirty years. years. Yeah, 30 for years, thirty years. Everybody, <laughs> we we still we you know everybody. We still talk to one another. You know, for Alex Hyde White and Joseph and Rebecca and 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 everybody. You know, we're all still close, and it's amazing. That never happens in Hollywood. Never. Right. right I mean, right. Yeah. Well, I should say never, but rarely. You know, rarely, that people yeah. become this close and, and, and this close knit as a family all these years later about over this project and, and our, our experience, you know, our spaceship might've crashed, but it made us stronger. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. 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 That's awesome. You can't kill us. No, we're no, dead. we're not dead yet. <laughs> <laughs> It's clobbering time. It's clobbering time. Well, on that note. That is All right. Well, thank you, guys. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Drew. Thank, thank you, Ben. Thank you guys are awesome. Glenn, as always, good to see you, brother. Good to see you. Take care. All right. Thanks, guys, Take for arranging easy. this. Yes, thank, thank you, you so much. For, uh, reaching yeah, yeah. out. Thank you. Yep. Of yep. Take care. Right. Enjoy your salad, you. uh, Drew. Yeah. Take care. <laughs> oh, yes. Thank you. Thank you. I will. <laughs> <laughs> listening to superhero stuff you should know (laughs) all right big thanks to dan for gathering the visuals for uh the youtube experience especially those screenshots of the the thing scene that i wanted to put in there because i knew yes he was going to talk about that uh let's go into some of the fan comments we last asked the the fans hey let us know if you went to see mask of the phantasm in theaters uh, and it looks like the rare few that went to see it are fans of superhero stuff you should know because we had a lot of comments nice. saying that they got to yes, see it. Yes, we did, so, yeah. Uh, FKA322 says, saw it in theaters when I was 10, felt more adult than the television show. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Like, yeah. I definitely felt more scared by Joker than I had in the television show. So uh, I think FKA can relate to that. Uh, Nate is the name, says, saw the movie twice in theaters, one after opening day because it was Christmas, and no way was my dad going to the movies on that day, <laughs> lol. Uh, the other in the cheap seats at a mall that's now gone. Funny story, kinda. The projector at the cheap seats was faulty, stopping when it was playing the trailer for Sister Act 2. <laughs> but when, when the movie played, it broke, and the lady told us it couldn't be fixed, so everyone left after seeing only two-thirds of the film. Jeez. Oh, that sucks. Uh, Waiting wasn't an issue for me as the VHS came out around my birthday and I saw it for a third time after Chuck E. Cheese. Hell Happy yeah. eight. Kidding me. God, the 90s were so awesome. Oh, uh, man, yeah. It's also God. relatable in terms of the whole, like, oh, yeah, it was that theater or the mall that's now gone. You know, like the theater. The yeah. theater that I went to see Mask of the Phantasm technically is still up, but it's been, like, revamped. It's this whole new theater and it just doesn't have the same soul uh, as it did back in the, the 90s oh, when I went man. to see Mask of the Phantasm and, and Batman Forever. That theater. Pretty much so. nine over ninety percent of the movies I saw in Alabama in the nineties were Carmike Cinemas. Uh, C A R M I K E. And yeah. I associate them so strongly with New Line because like I've said before uh-huh. on the podcast, New Line Cinema was killing it in the nineties. So mm. uh I don't know. Anyway, yeah, I don't even know if they're still around, but uh yeah, that was my nineties theater swallowed experience. Up by Warner's. Probably got swallowed up by something, yeah. 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 Uh, Camden said, not seeing this in theaters is still a thorn in my side as a Batman fan. <laughs> Thanks to the free Willy VHS for having the trailer. Yeah, I, that's, I think I saw, or was it the other way around where I saw free Willy? I, oh, yeah, I think the free Willy tra- trailer's on um, Batman Forever or something. Dude, I got to tell you. I seeing that right beforehand. I, I, I'm, I'm a child, of the, you know, I was born in the 80s, but I'm a child of the 90s, right? Yep, I've, I've never seen Free Willy, dude, and I've never seen Cool Runnings. It's just two big ones I totally missed somehow. I still uh, haven't seen them. I've seen, I, I've seen both. I was a Free Willy fan when I was a kid. I don't remember shit, but like I, I remember liking it enough. Yeah, I had the VHS for sure. Okay. Uh, on that one. 
so Camden says, we were busy that Christmas to see any movies. Yeah, that was the whole problem, I think, with that release date. Uh, I couldn't even talk my grandma into taking me and was eventually told to wait until mid-January to see it for my birthday. By that time, it was already out of theaters. was hoping there would be screenings of it last year, but nothing came to my area. Well, that's a shame. Sorry mm. about that. Uh, hopefully something will come up this year for Batman's 85th anniversary. Ooh, Hope 85. So. My God. Yeah, I know. You know, it's uh, It even occurred to me in the prep for this episode, I'm like, oh, yeah, it's going to be a 30th anniversary for this Fantastic Four movie. I didn't time it deliberately that way. This is kind of how it ended up happening. It happens, uh, so, dude. It's yeah. just weird timings when you're yeah. on the right path in life, bro. In- indeed, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to think I am. I'd like to think Both I am, are, too. Yeah. Yeah. Woo! Oh hey, man. Shout outs. You know what, guys? It's the first one of the year, so I'm gonna thank everybody. <laughs> thank everybody <laughs> on the Patreon list. Shasta, say Super Inframan, Nick Ooh. Noir, Jeffrey R, Alex of the What Mean Podcast, Jamie H, Pete B, Halsey C, R D, Benjamin V, Derek O, Bobby M, Slight Rebellion Off Madison, Sketchcraft, Kyle B, Devin H, JPF, Devin S, Carlos R, Jack G. Put your guns on. Michael C, Laom O, Cyber Six. And Mark M. And then our other supporters, Spark Again, SDCC Productions, Robert Schumann, Kooky Noms, Matt Herring, R.I.P., uh, Elijah B., Shamrock Balls, E.N.H., Walter the Wobot, John Wells, Rye Guy, Jackson Putnam, Tway N., Watson, a.k.a. Stage Bat on Instagram, Joey, a.k.a. W.Media on Instagram, and Paul G., uh, from now, you know, this is kind of a special deal. Not that it's, <laughs> yeah. not that it's the most work in the world, but generally speaking, I just do the latest people coming. But fuck it, it's the fucking new year. Yep. So there we go. Uh, there's everybody listed here, and uh, man, we, you know, it's clobbering time. I don't know what's some, some <laughs> f- Fantastic Four shit to say right here. Uh, we'll do. We'll go back to our usual Batman shit, which is we've told you about our friends. <laughs> <laughs> and now we'd like you wait what how's it go again do ben? us a favor <laughs> <laughs> i forgot which part i do which part you do <laughs> it's clobbering time it's clobbering time <laughs> all right we're out bye <laughs> bye